Welcome everyone to episode six of Trend Talks Threat Research. I'm your host, John Clay with Trend Micro, VP of Threat uh, Intelligence. And uh, this week I wanted to cover a research report that we did on ransomware and it's titled Understanding Ransomware uh, using data science. So I know a lot of organizations have looked at ransomware over the years, but our researchers decided to take a, uh, a an analytical look at all of the different aspects of uh, ransomware attacks that were seen. Um, we we partnered with Werata Analytics, who's an analytic company that was able to help us in the uh, looking at all the analytics of it. Uh, of this aspect, so it was kind of interesting. We looked at um, several different data sources uh, and collected, provided a strategic, tactical, operational, and technical threat intelligence to identify less obvious tendencies and find more complex correlations around the ransomware, so between different data sources and knowledge domains. So that was the premise of this report, this research report. You'll be able to see a link in the description of this episode, uh, so you can take a look at more in depth. I'm going to give you kind of a highlight of what we found in this because I think there's some interesting aspects of it if you're trying to deal with ransomware. Uh, which everybody is, unfortunately, uh, continues to ha be a problem. And I think we're going to continue to see it grow in 2024, uh, unfortunately. But let's look at a couple of things, a couple of areas of the research that we covered. Um, distribution of victims according by ransom payment status. So some of the conclusions we saw, there was a higher tendency to make ransom payments. We was actually seen in Africa, uh, whereas Europe showed a lower ransom payment rate. Uh, United States was about the in the middle. Um, victims with large number of employees tended to show lower ransom payment rates, which is interesting because, and maybe that's because uh, larger organizations have a little more um, sophistication around being able to uh, negotiate ransoms down. I know we did a research report a number of years ago where we actually looked at ransom payments between the uh, uh, discussions between the victims and the ransom act where actors. And there's definitely an opportunity to lower the ransom if you can negotiate and do some negotiation around it. We also saw um, payment rates varying depending on how data was analyzed, uh, which is kind of no uh, nothing new. Uh, if you if you slice something up differently, you'll probably see a different result. But some examples: um, organizations with 11 to 50 employees in Spain had a higher payment rate, even though Spain had a lower payment rate overall. Um, we also saw victims in the finance and legal industries showing a stronger tendency to, toward ransom payment. So uh, again, these organizations uh, probably are more likely to be able to pay a ransom uh, and, and also want to pay a ransom to get their operations back in, in action much quicker. Uh, similarly, mid-sized mid victims in the United States also held a high, very high ransom payment rate. Uh, so that was also interesting. If you're a mid-sized business in the US, you probably are more likely to pay the ransom than other sized organizations. Uh, another area we looked at is longevity, so ransomware group longevity analysis. Uh, in total, we looked at 69 leak sites during the research period. 29 of those leak sites had a short lifespan of less than 100 days, uh, approximately three months. Uh, 26 leak sites had a duration range ranging from 100 days to one year. And 11 leak sites had a duration range from one to three years, up to 730 days. Three leak sites had a duration greater than three years. So I think, you know, one of the things you can conclude here is that the majority of these leak sites are, on, are only going to be around from anywhere from zero to maybe one year in, in, in length. Uh, either that, either the, or the groups themselves dismember uh, or disperse or uh, they get too much heat on them because of law enforcement activities, uh, but they, they close up their leak sites. And then obviously in most cases, what they're gonna do is start up a new group, start up a new leak site or open a new leak site where they can start putting in uh, victim information in that. In the report, we actually do a pretty detailed analysis of Conti and Lockbit ransomware groups in this report. So you can get a lot of really good information. We deep dive into those those two groups because they're pretty prolific and they've got there's a lot of data out there about them. Um, so, you know, it's it's able to do some things there. One other thing that we concluded is most victims who do pay pay fast. 
the key takeaway is, is those who pay enable further attacks, though. One of the things that we found in this is if you do pay, you tend to further um, new attacks against six to 10 new victims. So unfortunately, you know, everybody asks, should I pay the ransom? Well, if you do pay the ransom, the likelihood is that you are going to uh, fund uh, another six to 10 victims out there uh, by this ransomware group by funding them. Um, so obviously, I mean, our, our recommendation is not to pay the ransom. I know law enforcement and FBI has said not to pay the ransom, uh, but uh, obviously every organization is going to have to make that decision. As part of your incident response plan, I would definitely recommend that you have that answered, that question answered. Will you pay the ransom if this hits us and affects our operations, affects our organization? So, you know, make sure you have, um, whether it's your, your um, uh, executives or your board, if you're a public organization, you want to make sure that you know up front very quickly, will I pay that ransom or not? So make that decision before it happens. Some other aspects of it, uh, business operation costs of cyber criminal groups depend on their business model. So knowing how ransomware groups operate under this business model sends important messages for defenders. Defending systems against uh, such attacks requires resources that are similar to or that exceed those uh, needed to thwart APT attacks. So, you know, typically if you think about a ransomware attack today, there's a number of things that happen before the ransomware malware is dropped in the organization. Obviously, there's an initial access component. That could be done by the group, it's the ransomware group themselves, if they're a full-fledged uh, business. Uh, but in many cases, it may be an a, a, uh, initial access broker who gets access to a network and then and then sells that access to another to the ransomware group themselves. Um, so that can be in fact in the, where you could actually have multiple groups targeting your uh, or being with inside your organization. Um, also, in most instances today, there's going to be a data exfiltration component stage before the ransomware is dropped. So they will initially access your organization. They'll do some network scanning to, to scan and map out your, your internal network, um, trying to find data, trying to find what systems you have there, what accounts you have. They'll escalate privilege into a lot of the administrative accounts, um, and then they will steal data. Um, sometimes they may steal very specific data if they have found it, but in a lot of cases they may just upload as much data as they can possibly do, vacuum it up. And then uh, later, at a later stage, they may then go through that data to find out other ways to monetize that data. But uh, then they will drop the ransomware. And, and again, this, this process could be anywhere from a, a, a day or two to weeks or months, depending on what they're doing inside your network. But obviously when, it, when the ransomware hits, you're gonna get that pop-up screen that says, hey, you need, you've, got, you've got ransomware and contact us to negotiate the ransom. At that point, you definitely know you have an adversary within your organization. Now you have to take the steps of what did they do? How did they get in? All of that stuff has to be determined. Your incident response plan is then fully operational and is, is taking the um, going ahead of uh, going ahead and, and trying to mitigate the, the the amount of damage done by these actors. So so again, these attacks are going to be very similar to what we see in APT attacks um, and uh, by these more sophisticated adversaries. Another breakdown of software uh, vendors exploited by the top five ransomware groups. One, Microsoft was about almost 50% uh, were um, exploiting Microsoft vulnerabilities. 7.5% uh, were QNAP. Uh, SonicWall was 5.8%. Adobe was 5%. And Citrix was 4.2%. And then as we go lower down, we, we also saw Pulse Secure, Excelion, Fortinet, Kaseya, and VMware. Uh, all being targeted with exploits being used in these ransomware attacks. So as an organization, obviously, patch management is critical. Uh, virtual patching works very well if you don't, if you can't patch very quickly. Uh, a virtual patch can take the time off you to, to deal with um, the full patch. Uh, but again, think about the, the different, if you have any of these uh, software applications that you're using inside your organization, you want to make sure you have something in place that can quickly patch those those uh, that software. So Microsoft, QNAP, SonicWall, Adobe, Citrix, 
Pulse Secure, Excelion, Fortinet, Casey, and VMware are probably the most popular out there. Um, we also talk about the role of professional negotiators. I mentioned earlier about the lower payment uh, by larger organizations. Um, if you can uh, either train somebody internally to become a professional negotiator or you, you uh, source that from an external person, there, there are groups out there that, that are um, professional negotiators that they can come in and help you in a situation. But in many cases, we see that uh, professional negotiators are effective at lowering the initial ransom amount down to, and we've even seen where it's it's been able to drop it on ninety eight percent. So uh, it's definitely um, worthwhile. And again, as part of your incident response plan, you may want to set up the this functionality. Have a ha, you know who, who's the number to the the company that we talk to? Who's my vendor to doing this? Or who is my internal person that can manage the negotiations? And then we also talk a lot about the role of cyber insurance. Um, certainly cyber insurance is happening uh, and, and causing um, some challenges for a lot of organizations. The, the insurance companies themselves are starting to dictate that you have to improve your, your uh, resilience of your uh, security and your networks. Um, so like implementing MFA, implementing EDR or XDR, all of these things are, are starting to come into play. They're requiring that if you want to either maintain your policy or get a new policy. So you want to make sure you have that as, as well as part of your incident response plan should be the number to your cyber insurance company. All of that and more is part of this research report. So I thought I'd highlight that in this version of episode six of Trend Talks Threat Research. Hopefully I gave you some good insights and maybe piqued your interest. So again, click on the link and you'd be able to re-download the full report. It's quite detailed. I only went through the kind of the highlights, but uh, certainly it's a very good talk, uh, discussion and research that can maybe help you understand the ransomware uh, business more more uh, better than, than you have in the past. So hope this was good. Again, I'm your host, John Clay, um, uh, Trend Talks Threat Research, Episode 6. Join me in two weeks where I'll have another one where I'll be covering uh, a, a number of different research uh, reports and papers that Trend Micro has published over the last several weeks. So uh, with that, I'll sign off. Have a great day. Stay safe out there, and we'll talk soon. Bye-bye.